Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Let's uh, take a minute to pray, and then I am going to share what the Lord has given uh, to me this week to share with you from our passage in Luke 5. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity this morning to, for me to teach uh, from the gospel according to Luke. Uh, and Lord, as is always my prayer, um, our desire, my desire, uh, is uh, for your word uh, to be applied in my life. And I pray that for each person here, that you would uh, cause us through the power of your Holy Spirit to, to hold on to something uh, from your word this morning uh, and cause us to desire to apply it and then show us, Lord, how to do that and then give us uh, the power, Lord, to do it and the boldness to do it where boldness is needed. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So though we have uh, um, taken a few detours along the way, we have spent, as you know, the bulk of the past five months examining Luke's gospel account, uh, with this morning's plan being to finish up chapter five. And so this means, believe it or not, that at our current pace of five chapters in five months, that we will be in Luke not only for the remainder of 2024, but most likely for a good portion of 2025 as well. And while for some this might be considered a slow pace, you know, for me it is a reminder of the depth and beauty of God's word, and also the fact that the Bible is so full of truth that it merits and deserves our careful attention to its every detail. Something that seems especially true when we consider the life and ministry of Jesus as revealed to us in the four Gospels. But then, as many of you have no doubt experienced over the years, we will have but scratched the surface, even after we eventually reach the end of chapter 24 and Luke's documentation of Jesus' ascension. Because one of the amazing features of God's word is that it always has something new to say to us each time we open it, even when we turn to familiar passages we thought that we knew inside and out. Now, as Pastor Bob stated in his very first message on Luke, back on the final day of 2023, each writer of the Gospels had a special focus, at least in terms of how they were led to present Jesus to us. So Matthew presents Jesus as the promised Messiah and King. Mark presents him as the suffering servant. And John's focus is on Jesus' identity as the one and only Son of God. Meanwhile, Luke, the only Gentile writer of the New Testament, by the way, presents Jesus to us as the Son of Man, focusing on Jesus' perfect humanity and the one that God sent to save all people, both Jew and Gentile. And as Pastor Bob has reminded us frequently over the past five months, Luke's desire was to present an orderly account of the ministry of Jesus the Christ so that those that read it or heard it could be assured of its veracity or truthfulness, thereby providing his readers with confidence to share its testimony with others. And since this is my first opportunity to teach from Luke during this series, I'd like to begin by sharing a few additional thoughts about his wonderful gospel account. My desire being to help further prepare us for all that we have to still cover and discover in the months ahead. And then after that, I'll focus my teaching this morning on the final 13 verses of chapter 5, where Jesus reveals more about the nature of his new work and the things that he came to offer mankind. So first... As you've probably figured out by now, assuming you did not know it already, Luke's gospel is very detail-oriented, often providing additional information that is not found in the parallel accounts of the other synoptic gospels that were written by Matthew and Mark. As a result, Luke's account is very factual. We saw one great example of this back at the beginning of Luke 3, where he introduces John the baptizer to us. He writes, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, 
and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So depending on how you count them, Luke gives six or seven specific facts regarding the timing of John's ministry before even mentioning John by name. And he does this, I think, to support his purpose of wanting his readers to have assurance that what he is reporting to them is true. And therefore, it can be trusted and confidently shared with others. But then, even though Luke's account is heavy on details, it is also very people-oriented, as he presents Jesus as a very personal Savior that routinely saw the needs of others before addressing those needs. And the fact that Luke was a doctor allowed him to present those needs in ways that the other gospel writers often do not do. For example, in last week's passage, Luke doesn't just say that a leprous man came and fell prostrate before Jesus, but that he was full of leprosy. And that's an important detail that highlights for us the magnitude of that man's plight. In other words, that dreaded disease covered every part of his body from head to toe. Yet Jesus reached out and touched him without hesitation, instantaneously healing him. It seems to me that Luke wanted us to understand that Jesus did not just go around randomly healing people, but that he deeply cared for each individual and their unique needs, just as he continues to do today for you and me. And then, in addition to being both detailed and people-oriented, Luke's account of Jesus' ministry is also very comprehensive. For while it includes many individual accounts that are also covered in the other Gospels, especially in Matthew and Mark, it also includes approximately 30 parables and events that are found only in Luke. Among these are the well-known parable of the Good Samaritan and the parable of the lost or prodigal son. Perhaps not surprisingly, Luke's gospel is the longest book in the New Testament, at least in terms of total number of verses, having 80 more verses than Matthew, even though Matthew's account has four more chapters than Luke's. In addition, of the four gospel accounts, Jesus' prayer life is displayed most vividly in Luke's account. In fact, there was an example of this in last week's passage in verse 16, where Luke noted that Jesus withdrew into the wilderness and prayed after great multitudes had come to him following his healing of the leprous man. And you'll find a selection of other verses that mention Jesus' prayer life on the sermon note sheet this week. And I think what this does for us is it highlights the vital importance and necessity of prayer and reminds us that if Jesus was never too busy to pray, then we cannot use that excuse either when our prayer life wanes. And then the last thing I'd like to share before we turn to this week's passage is something I heard recently regarding four reasons that we should be grateful to have Luke's account in our Bibles. These are important because they align with four of the greatest needs that we have as people that are, traveling, that are trying to navigate our way through life in a fallen world. And by sharing these with you, it's my hope that you, will be more deep, that you will more deeply embrace this wonderful opportunity that we have to spend so much time studying and hopefully applying what the Holy Spirit has led Luke to record for us. So first, Luke's account addresses our need for security, our need for security. Specifically, security that results from confidence in the accuracy and truthfulness of God's word. This is one of those things that results from Luke's careful and detailed presentation of the facts surrounding Jesus' earthly ministry. Then second, Luke's approach helps address our need to identify with Jesus, to identify with him. And this is important for us because we can sometimes struggle with identifying with him due to his power and perfection. After all, Jesus is God in the flesh. But Luke's presentation of Jesus' humanity helps us overcome this struggle as we encounter a very personal Savior that consistently demonstrates warmth and compassion toward those that came to him for help, setting an example for us to emulate when it comes to our interactions with others. 
Then third, and one that is related to number two, is our need for acceptance. Our need for acceptance. Luke presents Jesus as a loving, gracious, and merciful Savior that met people where they were, offering cleansing and healing time and time again. And then finally, Luke's gospel addresses our greatest need of all, our need for forgiveness. And while this is certainly true for the other three gospel gospel accounts as well, Luke's account has some unique aspects to it that seem to really highlight how Jesus meets our need for forgiveness. Consider, for example, that only Luke presents the conversation between the two thieves that were crucified on Jesus' right hand and left hand in Luke 23, verses 39 to 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That short conversation providing a beautiful picture of the gift of salvation that is available to all through Christ when they simply call out to him. So with that kind of background on Luke, from my perspective, let's go ahead and uh, turn our focus to Luke 5, a chapter that focuses on the difference that Jesus makes in the lives of those that have a personal encounter with him. So two weeks ago, we examined Jesus' call of Peter, Andrew, James, and John to full-time discipleship, with Peter clearly being the focus in Luke's account. And we saw how Jesus used a miraculous catch of fish to draw Peter to personal faith before giving him and his fellow fishermen a whole new purpose, namely to fish for people, a purpose that the Holy Spirit would empower as we see throughout the first half of the book of Acts. And then last week, in the middle portion of chapter 5, we saw Jesus make a difference in the lives of two individuals who were both in what we would consider to be hopeless situations. First, a man full of leprosy, and then with a man that was paralyzed and totally dependent on others to move him from place to place. But through those interactions, we also saw how Jesus was continually reaching out to others on the periphery. With the leprous man, it was with the priest that Jesus sent him to after he had been healed. As Steve pointed out in the Q&A after the message, this would have been something that had never been seen before. And therefore, it was a clear sign that God's Messiah had come. And then with the healed paralytic, it would be the first time in Luke's account that Jesus interacts with the scribes and the Pharisees, again, trying to get them to understand that the one they had been waiting for had finally arrived. Well, this brings us to the final section of Luke 5, where Jesus reveals some key details regarding the nature of of the new work that he had recently inaugurated. For he had come with a new work that brings new life. New life that offers spiritual health, spiritual joy, and spiritual wholeness to all who desire it. And our passage begins with Jesus moving on to his next appointment, an appointment with a man that would be a beneficiary of all that Jesus had to offer. So if you would, please follow along as we pick up where we left off last week in verse 27. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. So a few things to take note of here. First, this man Levi, whom Mark also identifies by the same name in his account of this call, is also known as Matthew, who was the writer of the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel according to Matthew. While Matthew never declares that in his Gospel, there is, overwhelming, there is a combination of overwhelming evidence between internal clues, early church testimony, and manuscript evidence to support the claim that Matthew wrote that Gospel. 
And then even Luke will start, start referring to him as Matthew in the very next chapter when he gives a list of the 12 apostles. And so even though we are not specifically told so, it does seem reasonable to conclude that Jesus gave Levi a new name as part of his call to leave his old life and follow him. Now regarding that old life, being a tax collector in the first century in first century Palestine was a very lucrative position to hold. So much so that there would be competition among bidders to attain specific contracts from the Romans. And since Capernaum was located on a major trade route, Levi's contract was likely a valuable and therefore highly coveted one. And as I think you, most of you know, their job was to collect taxes for the occupying Roman government. But they were free to add a surcharge to what Rome mandated. That's a nice way of saying that they were extortioners. And one probably did not have a lot of negotiating room with them, for they had the authority of Rome and her soldiers to back them up. Though they may have been paid a small commission by Rome, those surcharges were their primary source of income. And it seems that it was common knowledge that the tax collectors cheated the people they collected from. We saw this back in Luke 3 in John the Baptizer's instructions to the tax collectors that came to him to be baptized. It says, Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. And in Luke 19, we'll see that the tax collector Zacchaeus, in his confession to the Lord, mentioned his past dishonesty. However, I should point out that Scripture does not comment specifically about Levi in that regard. So we don't know to what extent he participated in those extortionary practices. In fact, it's even possible that he had heard and heeded the warning of John the baptizer and had reformed his practices accordingly. But even if he had, he was still a Jew that worked for the hated Romans under Herod Antipas and was therefore viewed, along with all the other tax collectors, as a turncoat or traitor. And not just a traitor, but a special class of sinner, as we'll see in our passage shortly. Interestingly, even Jesus made reference to this in his illustration regarding the final stage of church discipline in Matthew chapter 18. There, Jesus stated that when a person is excommunicated, they should be treated like a heathen and a tax collector. As a result, Levi's call is further proof that Jesus is never concerned about our history or background, and he does not worry that we will tarnish his reputation. In fact, Jesus often does his best work in the lives of those that society has rejected or classified as outcasts. In fact, Paul emphasizes this for us at the end of 1 Corinthians 1, where he writes the following. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the lowly things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in Yahweh. On the other hand, I think it's also worth noting that there was also a distinct contrast between Levi and the four fishermen that Jesus called at the beginning of the chapter. For whereas they had left behind a hard life where the income was highly unpredictable, Levi was called to walk away from a life that provided abundantly for him and his family, even if there were some social costs that came with it. And when he left his tax booth that day, there would be no going back. As the lyrics to the King and Country song put it, he burned his ship and then walked into a new life in Christ. And just like Peter, Andrew, James, and John did earlier in the chapter, he did not hesitate to leave everything 
and follow Jesus. However, what each of them left behind would pale in comparison to all that they would gain. And that's been my experience as well, and I hope it has been yours too. And then one final comment before we move on. You know, we find numerous examples of Jesus keeping divine appointments like this one with Levi throughout the Gospels. Pastor Bob talked about this last week and talking about how Jesus was very intentional, very purposeful. None of what is happening is random. So he has these divine appointments, it seems, uh, throughout the Gospels. And you know, I believe the Holy Spirit often arranges divine appointments for us probably every time we venture out into the world. So the key for us is to remember that we need to keep our eyes open and our hearts ready to share the love of Christ wherever he sends us. Well, then next, Luke informs us of what Levi did in verse 29. He writes, Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. So here we find one of those details from Luke that is not portrayed clearly in the other Gospels, namely that Levi proceeds to host a feast for Jesus and his disciples following his response to Jesus' call. And he invites a great number of tax collectors and others to that feast. Because of their practice of skimming off the top, tax collectors were generally wealthy people. And this separated them from most everyone else, especially the lower classes, who would have resented the injustice of having to support their lavish lifestyle. As a result, tax collectors, ostracized as they were, formed their own clique, separating themselves even more from the rest of society. But Levi does what we should each be doing. He invites those in his circle of influence to come dine with Jesus and learn from him. And in this regard, he models one of the ways that we can actually evangelize others, which is simply to spend quality time with them, inviting them to meet Jesus through us as they get to see how our relationship with him impacts our lives. You know, I think many of us remain silent too often, fearful that we don't know what to say to a non-believer or that we won't be able to answer their questions when the reality is that Jesus has changed our lives from the inside out, and this will only be evident to others when we provide opportunities for them to see it up close. I'm not suggesting that this will always be easy or even comfortable, but it's a step that many of us, including myself, need to take more often. As for the impact of Levi's action, we find that in Mark's account in Mark 2.15 says, now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. So that's a good reminder that spending time with Jesus and introducing others to him always pays dividends, even if they are not immediately apparent as they were in this case. Now up to this point in Luke's gospel, Luke has not documented many examples of Jesus taking the opportunity to explain his ministry to others. And those that had taken place, namely in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4, and then last week when Jesus illustrated his power to forgive sin by healing the paralytic, they were usually pretty brief and did not feature much in the way of a back-and-forth exchange. But here at the end of Luke 5, during or perhaps immediately following the banquet at Levi's house, Jesus uses four illustrations to help explain the nature of his work and ministry. And these illustrations point to three of the key things that Jesus offers to all who answer his call and follow him. So let's look at his first illustration that he gives in response to a question from the religious leaders that they make to Jesus' disciples in verse 30. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained or grumbled against the disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." 
So in this first illustration, we learn that Jesus came to offer spiritual health. Spiritual health. You know, after their previous encounter where Jesus perceived their thoughts, it seems that this time the religious leaders decided to attack Jesus through his disciples rather than deal with Jesus directly. But Jesus apparently overhears their question and intervenes. And their question reveals that they saw tax collectors as a special breed of sinner and as people to be shunned. In their minds, they were under God's condemnation, and therefore no self-respecting teacher would spend time with them, much less dine with them. But Jesus saw them as he sees every lost person, as individuals that were spiritually sick and in need of healing. The cure being repentance of sin, and then accepting Jesus' offer of forgiveness and the hope of a new life as a follower of his. Sadly, as we see often in the Gospels, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were mired in their own self-righteousness, and they could not see their need for this same healing, something Jesus points out to them on many occasions, including in his list of seven woes that make up the bulk of Matthew chapter 23. While they may have appeared to be righteous on the outside, they were thoroughly corrupt on the inside, just like every person is apart from Christ. But no one needs to remain in that lost and hopeless condition. Step one being to recognize that we have a terminal illness called sin that must be dealt with. In fact, until a person admits that they are a sinner and deserving of God's judgment, they cannot be saved. And for those of us that have done that, we are called to tell others the truth about sin, about death, and even about hell, and then also point them to the only remedy, faith in Jesus Christ, the great physician. And Jesus is indeed a wonderful physician. I love what one commentator says about this. Jesus comes to us in love. He calls us to follow him. He saves us when we respond to his call and place our faith and trust in him for our salvation. And best of all, he pays the bill for his work of redemption on our behalf. In summary, his diagnosis is always accurate and his cure is always perfect and complete. Well, sadly, Jesus' first illustration seems to fall on deaf ears, and it certainly did not elicit the needed response of repentance, but instead another question. Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? And he said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. They were not happy when they observed the apparent joy and fellowship that Levi and his guests enjoyed when they spent time with Jesus and his disciples. For that behavior was contrary to their practices and traditions, and therefore in their minds it was totally inappropriate. However, those legalistic practices and traditions had become very burdensome and had completely robbed all the joy from following and serving God. And so Jesus answers their question with a second illustration, this one by making an allusion to the wedding practices of their day, putting himself in the role of the bridegroom. For Jesus wanted them to understand that Messiah came to bring spiritual joy and freedom not gloom and despair. And I believe he used the illustration of a wedding feast because it pointed to the most vivid picture of joy and happiness in that culture. Even Jesus used the occasion of a wedding to perform his first sign miracle at Cana, as we see in John chapter 2. Now to get the fullest meaning of this, we need to recognize that, un that unlike in our culture, where the bride is usually the center of attention during a wedding, the bridegroom got top billing in a first century Jewish wedding. And in his role as bridegroom, Jesus came to offer spiritual joy to his wedding guests and to invite others to join them. God's Messiah had arrived, and it was a time to celebrate, not fast. 
Of course, we see similar imagery throughout Scripture, most notably where Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is his bride. But then Jesus makes another allusion there in verse 35 when he says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. In Luke's gospel, this was Jesus' first hint of his coming rejection and also an allusion to his future return to heaven. And Jesus makes it clear that his disciples will fast after that event. But even then, joyful celebration of our restored relationship with our Creator through the work of Jesus our Savior should be the primary experience for believers. We should consistently exude joy to the world around us, even when we are fasting, letting others know that following Jesus is a journey that is absolutely worth taking. And it is a journey marked by joy, the second of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul mentions in Galatians 5. But when it comes to being joyful, we must recognize that biblical joy is not dependent on our circumstances. It's not dependent on our circumstances. But rather, it is grounded in the hope of heaven and the fact that we will spend eternity with Jesus and be his honored guests at the marriage supper of the Lamb something the Apostle John describes for us in Revelation 19, verses 6 through 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready." And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And that's a celebration that all followers of Jesus can look forward to. Well, then Jesus' third and fourth illustrations come in the form of a two-part parable that we find at the end of Luke 5 in verses 36 through 39. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. So as a quick review, we've seen how Jesus has come as a physician to bring spiritual health to lost sinners, not to save the religious and self-righteous, that can readily point to the sin of others while rejecting their own sin. And then he has also come as the bridegroom to bring, to bring spiritual joy to all who follow him. And now here at the end of the chapter, we see that he has come to usher in the new, not to patch up the old. And in doing so, he offers spiritual wholeness to all that seek and follow him. You know, we see many examples in the Gospels where the scribes and Pharisees and other religious leaders were impressed or at least intrigued by Jesus' teaching and miracles. They might even have been content to incorporate at least some of what Jesus was offering into their traditions and practices. But Jesus uses this two-part parable to explain that that approach would not work then and it still does not work today. So first, Jesus explains that merging what he came to offer with Pharisaic Judaism would be like trying to patch a hole in an old garment with a piece from a new, unshrunk garment. But by doing so, not only would you ruin the new garment, but when the repaired garment was washed, the patch would shrink, rip away the stitching, and ruin that garment as well. Some from my generation can relate to this, as we learned that the best way to patch a pair of well-loved denims was to use a piece of strong but worn fabric, not new fabric. Otherwise, in that case, the patchwork would even look even worse than wearing those jeans with holes in them. 
However, when it comes to our faith, we don't want holes and we don't want patches. We want the real new deal that Jesus offers and that is represented by his perfect robe of righteousness. And then, to further emphasize his point, Jesus adds that it would be like putting new, unfermented wine into old wineskins. That was something one would never do unless you wanted to clean up a big mess. Because as the grape juice fermented and generated gases, the old, brittle wineskin would be stretched and eventually burst, resulting in the loss of both the wine and the wineskin. Jesus' point being that the new life he came to offer could not be forced into the old wineskins of Judaism. As for the final verse of the chapter where he says, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better, I believe that was Jesus' way of acknowledging the resistance he was already facing and would continue to face from the Jewish people, especially the religious leaders. And the apostles would encounter similar resistance, just like many of us encounter today when we share the gospel with others, because it's human nature to refuse what is new in favor of what is old and comfortable. Jesus used these illustrations to teach that he had come to usher in something new, not unite with the old ways that were passing away and that had become polluted over the centuries with numerous traditions and interpretations that God never intended. He had come to establish a new covenant in his blood and to write God's law on human hearts rather than tablets of stone. Later sending the Holy Spirit to empower us to live righteous, God-honoring lives as we are being transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. And this should not have been a surprise to these religious leaders. After all, God had declared what he was going to do hundreds of years before through prophets like Jeremiah who declared, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. And those religious leaders knew this, and so that's one of the reasons why Jesus now spoke to them in parables. He wanted them to think about and remember what God had declared so that those that were willing would realize that its fulfillment was now in process. In addition, I believe that Jesus used these illustrations to teach them and to teach us that it is impossible to integrate his teaching with any other religious system because they are incompatible. So while compromise and tolerance are wonderful concepts, They do not work when it comes to truth, because God alone determines what is true. As for a present-day application of Jesus' teaching, many of you have no doubt seen a vehicle at some point displaying one of those coexist bumper stickers, where the word coexist is spelled out using symbols representing various religious systems and philosophies. Its original version was created about 25 years ago by a Polish graphic designer for an international art competition. And at that time, it featured only the symbols that represented Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And he entered it to represent the need for tolerance between religions. However, it subsequently went through several modifications by others to bring in some additional belief systems, this being its most common form today. As I understand it, It seeks to promote peace and unity, in part by taking the best aspects from each system or philosophy and blending them together, a religion smoothie of sorts, creating a synthetic faith system that would presumably be acceptable to everyone, but sadly, 
would save no one. The other problem with this, of course, is that biblical Christianity is by its very nature exclusive. As Jesus declared in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And as Peter declared before the Sanhedrin in Acts 4, 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And while this exclusivity may be troubling to the world, I am always reminded of something I heard a former pastor proclaim many years ago. We should not be amazed that there is only one way. We should be amazed that there is a way at all. However, biblical Christianity is also inclusive in that the gospel's message is for everyone. But we don't come to Christ on our terms, but his. The good news is that his terms are grounded in grace, love, and mercy. How tragic it is that so many people hold on to dead religious traditions when they could lay hold of living spiritual truth and the spiritual health, joy, and wholeness that Jesus offers. So in closing, a few questions for us to contemplate. First of all, have you accepted and embraced that new life of spiritual health, joy, and wholeness that Jesus freely offers? If you have not, or you are unsure about it, please see myself, Pastor Bob, or Steve after the service concludes. And then second, assuming that you have, have you invited family and friends into your new life so that they too can discover what Jesus offers? That question, you know, is a huge one for me, especially now that I am no longer working for a paycheck and seem to have fewer and fewer relationships with non-believers. Then third, are there any ways you are still trying to build your new life in Christ on an old life foundation? Are there any ways you are still trying to build your new life in Christ on an old life foundation? You know, as I look back on my life, one of the best things God did for Karen and me was relocate us from California to Pennsylvania about two and a half years after I was saved. Because up until that point, I was trying to keep feet in both worlds, and that never works. And then finally, as we end each week's message, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for this incredible journey uh, that we have embarked on in the gospel according to Luke. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the many ways in which this gospel reveals to us the nature of Jesus' new work that brings new life to all who seek and pursue him. Lord, thank you that you make that easy, Lord, that your gospel is simple, that the truth is that we simply need to repent of our sin and turn to you in faith, just as that thief on the cross did nearly 2,000 years ago. So, Lord, help us to take the truths of this passage, help reignite or ignite the passion in us to want to share this truth with others in our lives that we either suspect or know that they do not have a relationship with you, but it is the one thing they need more than anything else. Lord, again, please go before us as we head back out into the world today and help us to have the boldness we need to share the gospel with others. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.